This is Professor Darif Seitz. This video is an introduction to data structures. First, we need to understand some foundational concepts. We'll start by looking at a commonplace thing that we're all familiar with, cars. Here's my car sitting in front of the Georgia Military College sign in Columbus, Georgia. For anything, the fundamental question is why? Why do we need it? And for cars, the answer just happens to be to transport people and things. The next question is what? What can they do for us? This is about the functionality and features that we're interested in about this vehicle. And what do we do to, to use them? Some examples to make them go faster. There's the accelerator pedal. We don't know all the mechanisms behind it. We just know we want to use that, and that's what you do. You press your foot on it. Brake pedal, same thing. There's a whole brake system there. We don't know how it works. We just know what we do. And that's what we want to do, to be able to stop. So the what is about our view of a car from its usefulness, from its functions. Of course, there's many, many different functions. So a few of them are listed here. The next question involves who. Who uses them? In particular, drivers from a usage perspective, but there are other people as well interested in cars, the manufacturers who have the construction perspective. They have to know more than just how to use them. They have to build them with all kinds of requirements that are necessary. And mechanics who repair them, fix them. And then how? How do they work? How are they constructed? Some examples of the internals of a car are the combustion system, the cooling system, the drivetrain system, the electrical system, and the exhaust system, to name some of the major systems in a car. This involves design, engineering, and blueprints. There are alternate products for a given component. Different manufacturers build different engines, but the engines serve the same purpose. There's different exhaust systems, different tires from different companies. So this is the concept of alternate products or implementations for a given component, a given concept. The question of when. When can they get us where we need to go? This is a concept of speed. How fast do they travel? They need to be fast enough or else they, they won't have a use. If they take too long to get somewhere. Related issues to when is how far can they travel? How much fuel do they consume? This is all involved in the operating efficiency of cars. And where? Where can we store things in cars? There's the trunk. Here you see my briefcase in there. The glove compartment, the console storage, various storages and add-on storage such as an attached trailer. This is the concept of storage capacity for things and there's also the concept of storage capacity for the human occupants of the car including the number of seats and the headroom. Carrying this over into data structures first let's define what a data structure is a very general, broad term. Any organized data. 
and it includes its access and update mechanisms. The first question is why? Why do we need them? To solve problems via computer automation to, be, to meet the business needs and requirements. This field is commonly called data processing. Data processing involves data and involves processing. Data is the relevant information and it ultimately has to be organized into data structures for processing. So the field of data processing, which is computer automation to solve problems, is fundamentally rooted in data structures and the processing that involves them. Processing involves transformations where data is input, then it's transformed through some process and then output in other formats or in other mediums. There's calculations involved, algorithms which establish the rules for the processing, and basic data manipulation, create, read, update, and delete operations, abbreviated as the acronym CRUD. Data structures what? What can they do for us? What are their functionality and features? What do we do to use them? As in the car, we had steering wheels and pedals and various control knobs. Data structures, to use them, requires a public interface. This is the external usage view of the client that needs to do the data processing. And also, there's a concept here of abstraction with these data types, which focuses on purely what they do and, and avoids the detailed implementation of how they do it. We want to be able to specify these interfaces, these useful operations that the clients expect to be able to use them without getting into the details of alternate constructions. Data structures, who? who? Who uses them? Application developers will use them. They're building applications, uh, doing data processing. They have data. They need to process it. And also framework developers, those institutions that create frameworks of components that provide these abstractions in class libraries. There's also a category that we can call anthropomorphic users where components themselves make use of other components and the components that are making use of another one are called the client. They're non-human users of these components. And of course, just like the mechanics, there's maintenance programmers who will need to be using them. How? How do they work? How are they constructed? This is the, the, the design, the engineering, the implementation beneath the public interface. This involves the internal construction view of what we call the server, the provider of the service for the clients. Concrete details as opposed to abstract concepts in usage. And again, design, engineering, blueprints, and testing. And just as in the car components, there may be alternate implementations of a data structure for a given interface, for a given abstract data type. Typically, these alternate alternates are based on a difference between array-based implementations and linked-based implementations, which will be talked about in a, a later video. When? When can they solve the problem? 
the whole concept here of time efficiency, effic efficiency, just like the cars. They need to be fast enough to get us where we need to go in realistic time. These data structures were concerned about the processing algorithms that are attached to them. They, they must be efficient so that we can do the job in a realistic amount of time. And this depends on the implementation details of the algorithms involved and also on the input data size and organization. Related issues are the amount of I.O. needed between memory and disk. Where? Where is the data stored during processing? This is the memory efficiency perspective. And this also must be realistic. We don't have infinite memory, even though these days there's more and more memory all the time. It's still a limited resource. And there's many programs and systems competing for it. And again, this utilization here will depend on the implementation details of the algorithms involved. And as always, on the input data's inherent size and organization. Data structures also have a need for order of complexity analysis. This is used to compare and select among alternate implementations where best, average, and worst cases are analyzed in terms of the time efficiency of algorithms and the space memory efficiency. As always, it depends on the data, its content, and its organization. In terms of time and space, there's frequently trade-offs. You cannot always optimize them both. Sometimes they're inversely proportional. Trying to decrease runtime may require an increase in memory usage, and vice versa, trying to decrease memory usage may increase the runtime. There's fundamentally three categories or types of data structures from a cardinality perspective. First, primitive data, a single basic type, such as an integer, and even a string can, is frequently considered a, a basic type. Next in complexity is composite data, a non-repeating group of different types. An example here is a student demographics record containing their name, height, weight, address, various things, a composition, but no repeating uh, items in there. And then the third category is a collection, a repeating group of the same or related types. It may contain zero items at a given point in time, but its purpose is to contain many items. Examples are customer queues, student courses list, strings themselves as being primitive types can also sometimes be viewed as collections of characters. Our focus on data structures will be on collections. We will formalize collections as abstract data types and analyze and compare alternate implementations with respect to time and space resource efficiency. Collection categories from an organizational point of view include these categories here, linear, hierarchical, graphs, unordered and sorted or ordered collections. First, linear collections. In a linear collection, each item in the collection except the first has a unique 
predecessor. And each item except the last has a unique successor. Examples of these collections are list, queues, and stacks. Here we have chairs in a row. If we start here with the chair closest to us being considered the first item in this linear collection, and look at the second item. The second item has a unique predecessor, the first chair, and a unique successor, the third chair. The first chair has no predecessor, and if we go all the way down to the end down there, the last chair has no successor. But they have an ordering here in terms of their positions. If there were students sitting in these chairs, the students themselves may not have an inherent order in terms of their names or their weights, but the chairs, the positions of the chairs, are what provide an order concept for this collection type. Next, we have hierarchical collections. The concept of a tree. This picture here, we have an upside down tree, just flipped around with some nodes here showing the various items in the tree. Each item, except the one at the top, which is not shown here, it'd be way up, also known as the root, has exactly one predecessor. The unique predecessor is called its parent. For example, this node right here, parent is this item here. And you can see every item has a single parent. And a parent can have multiple children and even the concept of grandchildren if you go down the branches. Each item has, a, has zero or more successors called children. Examples of hierarchical collections are trees, upside down, and heaps. Graph collections. In a graph, each item or node can have many directly connected items. Each of these directly connected items is called a neighbor. Depending on the direction of traversal, a neighbor becomes a predecessor or a successor. Examples are graphs. Here, these items, these nodes, represent a graph with the bars connection paths between them. So this node here has this neighbor here and that neighbor down there. It's a concept of a graph. Depending on how you're going through, what direction you're tracing through the graph, the concept of predecessor and successor dynamically changes. Unordered collections no inherent order to the items. The concepts of predecessor and successor are not meaningful. Examples are bags, Python dictionaries, and sets. Here we have essentially a bag. And notice those items that I put in there. There's no order. They're just arranged however. They might move around randomly. They're just contained in this container, this collection. Sorted collections, ordered collections, there's an inherent order to the items. These steps are sorted in the sense that you have to take this first one before you get to the second one. You have to take them in order. You can't go up here uh, to go in the order that they are. Examples of sorted collections, binary search trees, heaps, priority queues, sorted bags, sorted dictionaries, sorted lists, and sorted sets. There are some common operations, the what we can do with collections concept.
not the how it's done, just the what. They're also known as behaviors. One is to determine the size, how many items are in the collection. To test for item membership, to know if a particular item is in the collection or not. To be able to, tra to traverse through all the items one by one, examining them. To get a particular item, to insert an item in a particular spot in the collection, to remove a particular item, or to replace an item with another item. This concludes this introduction to data structures.